Good afternoon. I am Carolyn Chen, co-director of the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, along with Dr. Duncan McRae. And I am delighted to welcome you to the 2023 Berkeley Tolerance Lecture. In its seventh year, the Berkeley Tolerance Lectures were established in 2014 by a generous gift from Berkeley alum, Mr. Andrew Rowan, with the purpose of understanding the roots of religious intolerance. And today, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Suraj Yangde to address one of the most timely issues in religious intolerance in California today, caste discrimination. Three years ago, Dalit employees at Cisco waged the first U.S. employment lawsuit about casteism. And only two weeks ago, Governor Gavin Newsom vetoed a bill to explicitly ban caste discrimination in California. The issue of caste discrimination highlights the many complex layers of religious, racial, and ethnic tolerance that shape social oppression today. And there is no one better to help us understand this phenomenon than Dr. Suraj Yangde. Dr. Yangde is one of India's leading scholars and public intellectuals. He is a transnational Dalit rights activist involved in building solidarities between Dalit, Black, Roma, Indigenous, Buraku, and refugee peoples in the Fourth World Project of Marginalized Peoples. Dr. Yangde is the author of the powerful and moving bestseller, Cast Matters, and co-editor of the award-winning anthology, The Radical in Ambedkar. Cast Matters was named the best nonfiction book of the decade by the Hindu newspaper and is being translated into seven languages. Dr. Yangde has been named as one of the 25 most influential young Indians by GQ Magazine and the most influential young Dalit by Z Magazine. Dr. Yangde is currently a W.E.B. Du Bois Fellow at Harvard University. At Harvard, he's also been a senior fellow at the Kennedy School, a fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, and he was part of the founding team of the Initiative for Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability at Harvard. Dr. Yangde received his PhD from the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, he is also an international rights attorney by qualification from India and the UK. Dr. Yangde's forthcoming books are Cast, A New History of the World, as well as a biography of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. And he is currently at work at developing a critical theory of Dalit and Black studies. His talk tonight is titled The Moral Cost of Caste. Finally, before I turn the mic over to Dr. Yangde, I wanna thank the BCSR team, Patty Dunlap, Victoria Jashub, and JD Hoyt for organizing this event. And also a big thank you to our co-sponsors, the Asian American Research Center and the Center for Race and Gender. Now, please join me in wel welcoming Dr. Yangde. Thank you so very much, Carolyn. Um, thank you for getting me to UC Berkeley. I've been coming to this area, but not quite to Berkeley. From Stanford or some other institute, this was always missing, and so I was very happy to receive the invite and to make it. I want to... Oh, <laughs> recording. Um, and also, I want to thank Patty uh, for her work and making sure the administrative logistics will taken care of, and my colleagues at my office, Sam and everybody, um, I don't do well with the slides in my talk, so sometimes, you know, I just go something and then the slides are there, so bear with me. I'll try to make today the best of it. Um, and also thank you to everybody uh, for coming, uh, friends who have come from outside Berkeley uh, to attend this talk. I hope to make the worth of your time and coin. Um, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this project, uh, I've been, you know, I worked on recently, I mean, I tried to finish writing some of that stuff. And, and this talk kind of gave me a reason to, you know, uh, get back to the old school edits. So uh, let's begin. <clears throat> the story of caste has been as old as civilizational's rendezvous with phases of modernities. Therefore, to study caste and analyze its perfunctory objectives, methodological innovations have to be created. Caste found its way into society simply because it had reasons to operate by a dogmatic sanction. 
caste did not begin its function, role or action as a direct response to something. Caste is basically a nature of society that has seen dominating forces interacting with each other. Sometimes they conflicted with each other, at other times they faced each other. During this face-off, various cultural advancements took place now. Advance is something I am very concerned about. One of the first advancements to take place on the cultural front was in the domain of societal intimacy. Societal intimacy was predicated on how one lived in their fear and contributed to the public sphere. Fear then was mostly agrarian and had developed tools that would categorize their economic push into defining new classes. There have been instances where agrarian-based political economy was not always nonviolent. Neither was it compatible with various invading forces. Yet, after the clash of various migratory civilizations, a new society was put to function. The first was economic and the second political. To balance the economic impetus that had relied on living that, that had relied on living non-human beings, they had to create a structural device that would uphold and celebrate the tools that were productive in farming industry. Land-related occupations and otherwise started to gain recognition, and this led to the forming of a society that was not particularly new, but it certainly had its own ways of relying on natural resources to generate a surplus in terms of food and related resources. This land, at the central point of relation, started to develop in, way, in, rela in, in relation to various other productive faculties that humans in their abilities contributed. People participating in this economic adventure brought about innovative practices and created many more avenues for production based on farming and harvesting. Those who continued to inculcate their non-patented innovations created a private school of skill transfer. Prehistoric evidence across the world demonstrates that water and land played a crucial role in establishing modern social scapes. The nomadic population was brought to settle at a place to form a new society. Settling an otherwise free and wandering population into zones of a new habitat required a compromise. The political economy of ancient modernity became a precursor in the development of what we have today, tribal identities. Erstwhile, the intra-tribal structure relied on family relations that were often exogamous, where product, reproduction meant recreating the genetic lineage. Now, with intimate relations that had to be developed in an architectural alignment of new city, the foci of intra-tribal relations had to be mildly adjusted to tribal relations. It was not difficult for an already existing society to rehearse its own rules and project them onto the larger society. However, what it meant for those whose status of the nomad was still in existence, while those who had settled created a new standard in a society. Certainly the cities that eventually evolved into forming nations aligned to protect their interests, which were material vis-a-vis -vis land, structures, and their own families, providing an identity to their status. Identities developed as soon as different tribes started to interact intimately with each other. It was meant to identify with something that can be categorized as one's belongingness in society. With impending social identities, can one finally belong to the settled towns or are they suspects because of their identity? This led to the violent clashes between the nomadic and settled tribes. It was a hunt for survival and wherever one could find an excess of food and resources that could be advantageous for trade, war food took, warfare took place to own them. It was not necessary for the sexual traits to find a common language, possibly creating create new relations and join forces as a unified unit of culture. Thus, the exchange of families in the form of inter-tribal relations and sharing of resources to protect their kind from invad invaders brought new technologies of control. This control meant that the society had to be arranged particularly so there was an arrangement that would not violate the more socially pragmatic structure than cultural and ancient. In the absence of common cultural definitions, the settled societies had to resort to their private practices, which they enforced upon everybody. This model had superiority of a few and the inferiority of the many. This was to create the primary piece of what we have today in the advanced version, what we call it, caste. Basically, 
the premise is about how agrarian economic uh, foundations established society and how various kind of tribal identities started to gain recognition around the political economy of land and related resources. And eventually how one set of tribe became nomad and how another became settled. And then there was the establishment of a city, let's call it Athens and whatnot. And then with, due to access of resources for certain communities, certain tribes are starting to, of course, gain access to that. And when we started to have tribal relations becoming more confined to one's identity, because all of a sudden the, the trade of the city was somewhat became the identity of the city itself. So if you are a tradesperson from that city, your identity was about that city. But what happens when new tribes come in? That's when castes started to take place for various rules where mine and yours and very codified forms of system encourages and emerges. <clears throat> Dominance as a key feature was brought when only certain groups received the power to be dominant. Establishing dominance was not based on one principle. It was based on numbers, resources, industry, intelligence, and crudeness to bring about violence whenever it could onto its own people. Dominance was a compromise that was made between various tribal groups who had their own ways of measuring control. This was a management of a political system. Dominance also meant that a certain group would impose itself by showing strength and valor. However, in Indian society, the evidence of the past three millennia and more suggests that dominance is a key feature of society that was ideally developed in the struggle between two major forces. The first force was recognized as the one who had invaded the plains of North India. In contrast, the second force was identified as a genius tribal group that had richness of civilization and advantages in trade courtesy, rule, and order. The first force came to be known in today's language as Aryans, while the second came to be known by the linguistic identity as Dravidians, or the racial identity of Nagas. The story of settlement and nomadic life was about the story of settled indigenous groups and the nomadic invading groups. However, the story is not as simple. The human civilization as seen from the records of fossil fuels and archaeological evidence tell us that the state of nomad was also a state of displacement. It was an exploration of the troops to find an ideal place to establish their roots. This did not mean settlement, but it meant relying on a regular source. The technology was not advanced then, but the, society, but the settled society started to show results. They could live in one place and not go hungry. This appealed to the nomadic tribes to capture the warehouse of food and loot the wealth, warfing, um, warfare amongst nomad was a feature. They clashed with those tribes who had resources. The settled tribes in the warfare tried to exert dominance with the use of advanced weaponry and also deployed the diverse tribal groups who were now part of the settlement. However, only some people could fight because the new society was arranged in a way that only gave power to few to lead the warfare on the battlefield, while the rest were subservient. With the strength, the nomads could attack, and if successful, they would rule over the settled tribes. The transition from nomad to settlement was not an easy phase, because it meant that new rules and laws of settled tribes had to be imi imitated. The nomads then also brought their own ways of social laws into the settled tribes, and that is how the rule book of ancient modern Indian society was birthed. To recognize was to give respect. It also meant one could negotiate with their new invaders about their pre-existing positions in society before the invasion, or arbiter about their participation in certain scale economy. B.R. Ambedkar brings our attention to a category of groups that were called defeated tribes. <clears throat> the group that the forces had defeated could be either a nomadic invading group or a settled civic group, civil group civic group, excuse me. The defeat in warfare did not just mean losing resources, but it also meant losing one's status. The status here then was organized not according to one's skills and trade, but also according to one's lineage. Thus, a new category of defeated tribes was formed. The defeated tribes were then incorporated into society by not fully inculcating in them the honor and recognition available in the settled society. They had to be part yet set apart of civic organization. Defeated tribes were broken groups of people. These broken men 
were vulnerable and prone to attack as they were not part of either of the tribes that had resources and power. Due to their exposed condition, they needed patronship to guard them and offer refuge. A compromise was reached between the broken men and settled tribes. The settled tribes needed guards and the broken men shelter. It worked for them mutually to have each other. But the problem with broken men was that they were not equals and were aliens to the settled tribal organization. Besides, they were just employed to protect. So an exterior part of the town that needed guarding was given to them as their habitat. They settled there with families as outsiders, easily distinguishing people that carried a marker of them being outsider. Dr. Ambedkar argues this system that existed in primitive society contributed to the for formation of what we have today, untouchables, and thereby their vocation. Ambedkar looks at the Hindu scriptural evidence, Antya, Antayaja, Antayavasin, and Bahaya. He interprets Antya as a term that described those groups who lived outside the village quarters. The same definition, if liberally studied for the other three groups, meant the same thing. However, it did not satisfy the reason as to why there existed groups that were named differently but served similar purpose. For the untouchables, it was a survival value. For those who made it through the injunctions of the caste system and survived. Though these terms mean somewhat similar, they do not conform to the accepted wisdom of simplified, toned-down version of the caste system by providing a singular narrative. Ambedkar challenged the normative understanding of caste that had been considered as established. He looked at various references in the Hindu canons, such as Dharma Sutras and Smritis. He looked, neither of them offered a clear view of what Asprasya, untouchable, meant, or if they were the same people. Even Orientalists, such as Buller, who interpreted Sanskrit, relied on literal translation of Sanskrit to arrive at a conclusion of what it meant to be lower caste. Ambedkar, however, relies on spatial and sociological dimensions to realize the existence of untouchables. Many times, the chandalas, i.e. the outcasts, were the challengers to the caste system through an act of miscegenation. This evidence, clubbed with primitive society's spatial ordering, demonstrates the outcasting of group were later ritualized into untouchability. Living outside also correlated with the subordinate position in the society. This is clear with the jobs the untouchable were forced to do. However, these downgraded jobs were looked up as favors and rights done upon the untouchables. Thus, the untouchables came to be identified with their lowest status job as their right. Status meant rights. Right to dead animals' meat, right to servitude, right to collect harvest from seasons, and right to collect food. These rights were meant to hoodwink the untouchables into professional enslavement. Ambedkar explores if such evidence existed elsewhere outside India. He could find studies in Ireland and Wales. He means it meant that he was exploring avenues of the broken men elsewhere in the world, which certainly due to unavailability of advanced research available to him, remain unreported. But such theories of caste as untouchables who live like broken men, i.e. defeated tribe, exist in part of Africa and Latin America. I worked on this in global castes. The different tribes in society became not only participants, but very important additions to the creation of a new society that was highly sophisticated in its operation and order. The order was simply a norm, but yet it was made a law, a social order law. This happened with the advent of Brahminism through the laws of Manu in Manu Smriti. In the phase of counter-revolution, which was against the then established aspects that they were a mix of native culture and Buddhist religion were brutally attacked to subordinate into the Brahminic order. Basically, the revolution, counter-revolution refers to the phase of revolution in the sense of an advent of Buddhism within ancient India and counter-revolution as an advent of Brahminism to counter the Buddhist values. However, there is, of course, a mix of these two values. Uh, Johannes Bronkhorst argues the Brahmin's affinity with power and experience of being a pragmatic advisor advantaged them over the Buddhists who were seen as ascetic beings. But the problem lay in the political project of Buddhism, which was not formed to govern the state, while Brahminism's tenet had been about controlling the state resources to utilize them 
for the advancement of their goals. <clears throat> the moral cost of caste is an absence of ethics and value granted to each person in a fixated hierarchy. Therefore, there is no morality in caste. However, paradoxically, it relies on moral superiority gained through the sanction of a spiritual and religious order. The character that is contested within in the dynamic of caste scripture prolongs the debate about righteousness, virtue, and the temerity of the system as a whole. Here, the moral notion is less about conduct and more about self-facing value, drawn from the notions of what one can look up to and what one can do to deny the principle of the former, i.e., what to look up to is considered standard, while denying something is again drawn from the standard of the same lineage that describes morality into an artifice of human and intra-human relations. To simplify, looking up is considered a dynamic relation that is, revered, that is revered and valued as a supreme height of human existence. It is protected with a religious value, while looking down is considered a part of religious order. It is so regretful that it has to be banished. Therefore, in the society that was erected according to the parlance of learned hierarchy, looking up became an order of reverence, while looking down became an order of despise. The irony of the principle of caste then becomes a confusing mandate proposed to people because there isn't one unit that is placed on a higher plane, but there are units. Each unit has its own demographic, cultural, and scriptural evidence of superiority. The ones placed at the bot, placed at the quote, looking down upon order, are again multiplied into units. Meaning the people who are at the bottom are also multiplied into various units. These multiplicities of units arranged strictly into an order created chaos. The chaotic disorder is still a sorted social order of caste society. Caste then is a functioning rule of a disordered society that does not demarcate power but certainly centralizes superiority. Each unit of various group has its own sense of superior units which draw their authority through rigid maneuvering of history. These zones of superiorities are working like micro-republics where the ubermensch, the final authority, is located in the higher imagined planes. To prove the superiority, one has to have a sense of achieved consciousness. This is the domain of spiritual exercise. Not many have the opportunity to access and thereby treat the scenario of higher planes. Therefore, to continue such an exercise by recruiting the disorder social habitus, various stories and examples are manufactured to suit the need of common people. Dogmatic evidence is encoded through artworks in the erection of religious organizations. Paintings, sculptures, and edicts are used to re-emphasize the knowledge of the divine authority. And the ones who have the right to interpret and communicate with the divine authority remain within the ambit of monocaste units. The monocaste group here identify with the divine, i.e. not a representative of the divine, but the divine himself. By making them earthly evidence of the higher plane, they then draw examples to continuously prove their superiority of self that is continuously challenged by the ones who do not have the superior authority. <clears throat> The state of Brahmanatva, which is achieving a certain state of wisdom, is then reduced to a unit of a group. The group solidifies into writing itself as a making of karmic merits of several thousand years. This means that the Brahman is not born, but it has achieved the status of Brahman because of their past karmas, quote, after passing through numerous wombs and being born again and again, end quote. The passage of life, the vagina, which is considered a dirty, sinful object, yet beautifies itself by birthing the suitable Brahman. The suitable, this suitable Brahman can be born by the endogamous intermixing of karmas and incestual relations. As a result, an ideal Brahman man is welcome, but he is still not pure. 
He's superior by birth, but not divine. He has to undergo the passage of rites to become the divine, which is the practice of Upanayan. After ceremonial acknowledgement, the Brahmin male child becomes someone who can be described as superior and thereby a new form of divine. He may not know the actual stages of achieving the state of Brahmanatva and might not even be educated in the rituals, but still he becomes a Brahman by birth. Brahman by virtue and consciousness often remain aloof from announcing their Brahmanatva. The practice and achievement themselves denounce them from holding on to the wretched ego that is an antithesis of Brahmanatva. In the Anusasana Parva, Yudhisthir is conversing with Bhishma. This is an episode of Mahabharata, who is on the deathbed, giving away his learned wisdom. Yudhisthir, the king, inquires about the process of attaining, quote, the status of a Brahmana from three inferior orders, which is the caste, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. What would it take for this inferior caste? He asks the question to the dying Bhishma. He quotes, is it by penances the most austere, is by penancing the most austere or by religious acts or by knowledge of the scriptures, end quote. Bhishma leaves no doubt that the three inferior orders are incapable of attaining the status of the quote highest. Brahmana is achieved in the journey of many births. Explaining the importance of such a birth, Bhishma narrates an incident of Matanga, an offspring of a Brahman man and a Chandal woman. Now this gets complicated. Is this a Brahmin man or is this a Shudra man? As you see, the story goes forward. Matanga grew up knowing that he was indeed a Brahman. But upon discovery of his Chandala root, it was said that he lost the status of the Brahman. He wanted to know the reason for this. The story goes as such, that his mother of Brahman descent, while intoxicated and besotted with desires, procreated with a Shudra barber. As a result of this exogamy, made him a Chandala. Matanga is distraught and confronts his father about his origins. Now, the only aim left for Matanga is to acquire the lost Brahman status. It is because he had, quote, been begotten upon by a Brahmani woman by a Sudra, end quote. Unresolved by this, Matanga resorts to further penance. He stands on his one foot, drawing the attention of other celestial beings. Sakra, the Hindu king of the heavens, appears before him and discourages him. To overcome the sin of his birth, Matanga wants to, quote, undergo the severest penances, end quote. He goes to the forest and keeps performing the penances, inviting the attention of the gods. Impressed by his devotion, Indra, the god of heaven, offers Matanga boons, but wants to know the reason for his penances. He assures the devotee that even if his boons are unattainable, he shall grant them. Matanga replies that is desirous of attaining the Brahmana status. The Indra responds that that was an impossible proposition of attaining the Brahmana status. The Indra responds that that was an impossible proposition as Brahmana status is not acquired by quote, persons begotten on unclean souls end quote, and cannot won by mere penances. He further warns him of quote, self-destruction should he pursue this. Brahmana was the last achievement, foremost of everything. One could not just attain it. Through Bhishma, the authors of Mahabharata ensured that no amount of confidence or hint of emancipation was brought into the minds of the outcast. By condemning the birth of a Chandala, they indoctrinated the belief that one's birth mattered more than any type of talent or hard work. Due to his qualities and abilities, Matanga was a front runner in seeking Brahmanatva. By his efforts and devotion, he had qualified to attract the attention of celestial gods. Yet even after meriting a higher plane, he was told by the gods that his fate of birth had decided his quality of life. For he is incapable of acquiring the Brahmana. Brahmans were womb born. Caste as a virtue of birth took precedence over handwork trade, valor, industry, labor and sacrifice. We go back to the, how the modern society was formed. It did not matter for a Chandala to be on the top in spiritual practice. The story of Matanga, when repeated in popular lores, sends a message to the outcasts that they cannot hope for a better life and emancipation. 
the other caste in varna order kshatriya vaishya and shudra could at least have a shot but with graded efforts the chandala after severe penance and a thousand years time could attain shudra status he had to wait for another 30000 years to become a vaishya then another 60000 years to become a kshatriya and after this 60 times multiplied by 60 one is born a fallen brahman he is yet to be born into a race of brahman where he is still a lower one to practice the profession of arms in order to be a brahman to el- in order to be a brahman eligible to recite gayatri and other mantras he has to further wait for another 300 years following this if he is to attain the brahman status of a higher race who is conversant in the entire vedas and scriptures he has to now confront the aversions of life and master it if he does he becomes the higher plane brahman if not he falls to the ground from a higher top birth into specific caste thus becomes a passage to a higher plane a savarna therefore by default had to withhold to their position after being pampered and praised so heavily for their birth they stood to protect their cause birth and discipline provided the possibility of emancipation for one had to be into the fold of varna avarnas the chandalas the untouchables the dalits plausibly excluded indira ensures that martanga hears the fate of his birth one born as a chandala can never attain to the status which is regarded as the most sacred among the deities and asuras and human beings this fatal blow to the aspiration of the outcast guided the forces of spirituality and mukti the hindu codes of religious law continued this advice and encoded prohibitions and power only to certain castes i call this ex secularizing dharma the arbitrary power granted to the brahmin in letters and vocal diction to interpret the world and society is known as sanatan dharma sanatan dharma is interpreted as a universal code based on set principles is it a cosmic order that details how the world works within this cosmic order emerges what is called manav dharma through the shastras the shastras offered a supposed universal logic which was considered a universal principle of truth this logic meant the distinction between truth and false right or wrong was considered on the directives of shastras because they were divine universal principles this was then secularized as a non denominational approach making the hindu interpretation of human divisions a divine probability which is basically to make it secular the hindu codes were then made that this order is not actually given through certain caste but it is a divine interpretation and offering divinity they wanted to make it a secular practice not confined only to the or only uh, to the liturgical reading with this secularizing of dharma came the duties that appeared close to the buddha shila and ashtanga marga not to steal to control senses seeking knowledge pragya which wisdom among others the origin of caste and its validity was justified through the anodyne logic of caste laws caste laws being universally acceptable principles as we see offering a divinity as a support and then saying it that these were universally acceptable principles in the sanskrit lexicon it came to be known as jati in a study of hindu canon and caste vina das argues that the hindu rituals and practices differ from theories and texts of the hindu system the sanskrit canon advocates for stakes in human endeavor at the same time the longer term practice of any order requires one's own self as an agent of that praxis vinadas's unique contribution to this field is that she departs from the teleological trope of literary value to uncover what appears to be a deeply sociological study where vinadas actually does a sociological analysis of the hindu dharma shastras to really provide what it means to have beyond the spiritual dimension of the study there is no definitional semblance to the nature of caste caste in its operation appears starkly different from its written evidence in the texts caste law appear cruel but the practice is still violent the relations within the codes of caste are divisional and toxic caste prohibits social growth or as ambedkar drawing from john dewey would refer social endosmosis 
caste compares with identical discriminatory systems but differs from dialogical attributes of labor and industry as ambedkar wrote exploring the many dimensions of untouchability and slavery slavery was communicable but untouchability meant banishment this merits further exploration of caste in light of untouchability or caste as a system operating independently of the untouchables as a system of labor untouchability of castes untouchability could mean that there is a relation developed on fractured manipulations of human civilization the other edge of that meaning is that untouchability is purely commerce at the same time untouchability is also a religious approved sanction this form of interpreting and dividing society based on one's birth is unique to the stratification of the indian brahminical caste system the twisting of social principle was indefensible yet it received strong pushback from various players in system in the system which is basically within the hierarchies of the caste system various forces were pushing back and these were mostly spiritual leaders and cultural actors who challenged the strength of caste one of the examples is we can see of course with buddha nath tradition we can see to the bhakti tradition there has been constant pushback upon this eventually religious approval of an indefensible governmentality was created to honor the rising differences between the ruled and the rulers creative apparatus for the caste system was brought into place through the assistance of the ruling classes the spiritual module needed state support thus the power relations were brokered between the meditating soothsayer i.e. Brahman, and protector of gods on earth, the Kshatriya. Untouchability is a society's failure of humanity. It classed an entire group into coded castes and then declared them untouchables. The delirious nature of the Brahminic untouchability is that it further extends impurity on the corporeality as well as senses. Ocular appropriation is one of the pillars of the caste system. The untouchable cannot exercise autonomy on the things in their purview they are not meant to be independent the untouchable therefore also needs to be policed the shudra and ati shudra including women of all castes are not allowed to visually experience the complete spiritual dimension the sanctum of a religious place is an exclusive habitat prohibited to everybody barring a few notable nobles these high bound groups of people are mutually tied to the superiority principle of caste hierarchy the fear of exposing the sacred kept secret is a monopoly of the few the tiny space of spiritual action is guarded because it needs protection from the defilements and impurities of the world the impure ones are already prescribed in the dharmic order such prohibitions exist elsewhere too but what makes this system different is that it accords hereditary caste ranking which is different from other ritual prohibitions thus categories of caste are continuously made through the spherical chakras of birth and death there are groups who are notified as high or low in the chakras of birth and death a class of non high borns ie the lowered beings marked with birth based karmic impurities are readily available in the economy of spiritual needs and labor exchange these markers are not easily identifiable to the eye but the thousand years of practice and physical segregation reveal the nature of one's caste location but still one is not sure how one manages to create an entire class of people who are essential to agricultural production and services to be notified towards the bottom of society meaning you still need them but yet you have to put place them at the bottom one explanation is that seclusion was mandatory to maintain order in caste society therefore segregation was essential but what is the reason for prohibiting access to spiritual equality it is the fear that the masses might find independent ways to worship and grow in spiritual religious practice leaving the monopoly of the middle man the brahman into question this was going to disturb the continuing order of the caste system thus devices of control and prohibitions were made punitive and sinful that is why untouchability human beings that is why in untouchability human beings were not just made unacceptable but an additional injunction was put upon them that made them unseeable and unapproachable 
here unseeability was both ways the ones who cannot see certain things and others who cannot see the ones considered impure while in the unapproachability index the person's labor is essential but he cannot be called upon to provide services he needs to be ordered and for that relation of power has to be maintained he needs to beg for the services he has to provide through his labor this means he has to approach the master which makes it his own responsibility of the slave i.e. servant to provide the service as a matter of his life the right to slave while for the master it is prestige and honor that he has to maintain which gives him satisfactory affirmation of his role as a supreme lord there were obvious differences in the way castes related to society and how castes maintained in relationship with each other guriye for example the india sociologist provides evidence of such caste wise rules and protocols applicable to particular caste groups he presents in how sociological dimensions of textual practices are enacted into social habitus these actions were driven by the motivation to adhere to and sustain a biopolitics of nature and action thank you